so my name is Johan Olstam. I'm a senior research leader at VTI, but also associated with Linköping University. And uh, my name of my talk is Will Automate the Vehicle Decrease Congestion? Question mark. And as I said, maybe to today, maybe we don't. The question is if we have automated vehicles uh, in the future, we'll probably have. And, and the question is, will that, how will that affect traffic and, and congestion? Uh, so I would like to uh, tell you a little bit on, on this, um, what the automated vehicle is and, and why uh, the traffic planners or the cities are interested in it and, and uh, how uh, you can maybe uh, investigate the impacts of automated vehicles um, and also um, what the challenge is, is on estimating this because it's not straightforward. Cities and, and traffic planners uh, have uh, lots of problems in the large metropolitan areas with, with air pollution, traffic congestion and safety issues. Uh, we would like to have more livable cities uh, and uh, we would like to have this kind of parking problems we would like to deal with. We would like to have uh, attractive public transport systems and so on. And the current uh, question that most cities and traffic planners ask themselves is how and when uh, can automated vehicles or connected auto vehicles help solving these kind of problems we experience in the metropolitan areas? So this is a, a, a big issue uh, at the moment. And uh, there are large uh, expectations here on, on uh, that automated vehicles can maybe solve everything. You can have less congestion, you can have safer traffic, you can get rid of all, uh, all the, the, the vehicles parked everywhere, so you don't need to have vehicles parked. But uh, there are uh, quite a long transition period until we actually have automated vehicles and 100% automated vehicles uh, in our traffic system. We will have this kind, kind of long period where we will have a shared situation. We'll have some part of automated vehicles, some automated vehicles, some manual driven vehicles. We'll have pedestrians and bikes and so on. And these will have to coexist for some time before we reach 100% penetration. Depending on, on uh, how this technological development uh, foresees, so how quick we get more and more advanced automated vehicles, but also on policymakers uh, and also on, on this kind of um, uh, regulations, uh, we will have a progress towards this uh, uh, situation with 100% automated vehicles. But the interesting thing here is that automated vehicles have the potential uh, to actually uh, decrease uh, the traffic performance or increase congestion. If they become that popular that you can use it to go from any point to any point you like, why should we use public transport systems at all if you can have your automated vehicle uh, driving you uh, anywhere? Uh, so it's a, a risk for having an increased travel demand and there's also increased in vehicle mileage. So we need to actually deal with this in, in a good way. Uh, so depending on, on how we deal with it, we can maybe manage a, a modal shift or a shift to a more attractive uh, situation where less congestion and, and safer situation. But that depends a little bit on, on where we go. So we, we need to try to estimate uh, the effects uh, on, on traffic. But what is then an, an automated vehicle uh, that maybe is everyone has uh, their own picture maybe of it? And uh, I think it's, uh, I had a very interesting uh, idea from a colleague in, in a project uh, that he showed this picture. And, and is this an automated vehicle? No, it, it isn't. Uh, and you might wonder why I show this odd uh, picture of a, uh, of a rhinosaur. But anyone knows the history behind this one? This is a, a drawing by um, uh, Albert Dürer, and, and he had never seen a rhinosaur when he drew it. This is drawn based on a presentation um, uh, from, from another person. This, this uh, to some extent, is similar to what we experience with automated vehicles. Uh, how many have, have actually been driven in automated vehicles? And, and uh, 
that's not that much uh, people have been doing it. There are automated vehicles coming now, we see it in the media, but how will the automated vehicles of the future look like? That's more or less we are feeling, the traffic planners are feeling like Albert Duris was uh, feeling when he drew this. He's, you try to draw a picture of the future based on someone else's presentation uh, on what you would expect. Another way of of uh, uh, looking at automated vehicles is this kind of standardization. There's these SIA levels uh, for um, trying to describe what an automated vehicle is. And it becomes quite clear that there's no one automated vehicle, so different levels of automated vehicles, from manual driving up to these kind of driver assistance systems we have today with adaptive cruise controls. And then when we come to something that maybe could be called self-driving vehicles, then we are at this level level three, as you see here, uh, and, and this level four. And the difference here is at level three, then the driver should be the backup option uh, to the automated vehicle. And in level four, uh, we have the vehicle manufacturer actually responsible for, uh, for, for the vehicle, and the vehicle should be able to manage all situations. So we are today maybe at level 2.5, we have these kind of adapted cruise control systems, these systems to keep you in the lane. Uh, you may have heard about Tesla and others that uh, around. Uh, and uh, we are several vehicle manufacturers talking about uh, level three as a big problem because having a human driver as a backup for, for a system is not that good. Uh, that's uh, known from other areas. And, what we can expect is that we could see maybe this kind of level four coming in the less complex um, environments like motorways and so on first. So why is it difficult to then to try to estimate the effect of automated vehicles? That comes back a little bit to this uh, rhinosaur. We don't really know how these automated vehicles will behave. There are some first generation now that there are some testers, there's some data around, but for the future ones we don't really no, and we have no data. And then this transition period towards 100% of uh, automated vehicles will be quite long. So there are lots of uh, uncertainties related to the behavior of the today's automated vehicles for the behavior of the future automated vehicles. But what I think is, is important that maybe sometimes is forgotten is this transition period of this mix of vehicles. So we will have quite a long... Uh, uh, situation where we have different kind of, of automated vehicles and we don't really know which of them will uh, coexist with which is others and uh, we don't really know the penetration levels of this difference. If we would like to know on, on how automated vehicles actually could affect the traffic system uh, and, and the congestion we could look at the different parts of a traffic network. So in the simplest version, there's links and there's intersections. And on the road links, the capacity in some sense, the number of vehicles per hour that can pass a cross section. So if we can keep very short gaps between the vehicles, we can push more vehicles through. So uh, short time gaps, then we can have a higher capacity. Uh, another thing that uh, affects the capacity of the link is the reaction. So depending on if we have a quick reaction, short reaction times, and, and how uh, strong you react, the, the capacity will differ. So if we have the worst case, that's we have slow reactions and very uh, strong reactions, then we can have this kind of congestion out to nothing. One vehicle starts decelerating, and then the next one uh, doesn't notice uh, so quick, and then it decelerates stronger and stronger, and then we'll have this vehicle standing still in that. And uh, what we have also is, is lane changes. Uh, so every lane changing is some kind of a disturbance in this kind of flow when we push vehicles through uh, on a road link. So the more lane changes, the more disturbance, the, the more risk for, for traffic breakdown. Last, what I think is quite important again, this heterogeneity. So the difference between traffic and this kind of flowing water in a pipe is that uh, not everyone drives at the same speed. So if everyone drives at the same speed, no one catch up with another, then we could, in theory at least, keep very short gaps and just flow the vehicles like, like the water in the pipe, but that's not the case because we catch up with other, uh, other slower vehicles and then we like to overtake. But 
so this has been lots of studies, and then you think about this can be, uh, with automated vehicles we can have these shorter gaps and so on. But uh, the problem is not that much on the road links because that's not where we have the bottlenecks. The bottlenecks is at the intersections, and there it's the availability of the gaps uh, in the major stream. So if we would like to merge in, in, in a stream, then is there a gap that I can go into? And from the mandal driven uh, point of view, that's how large gap do I require. Uh, some would like to have quite large gaps. And then we have uh, reaction time, how fast you react and, and also on um, uh, how smooth you actually merge. So interesting question is if we can drive vehicles very close when they are automated, if we have long platoons with vehicles which are driving more or less bumper to bumper, what happens at the merge? So how to merge these kind of two platoons? It's, it's, it's clear that if you have 100% vehicles, then we can have this kind of nice control algorithm that actually increase the gap and then you put uh, like a perfect zipper. Uh, but for this coexistence period, when we have manual vehicles that should also try to understand what this automated vehicle will do or not do, then this could be the, the problem. And I think this is also something that's not that much looked to yet. So, uh, how do we think maybe that these automated vehicles behave? You can uh, either try to go and look on these uh, vehicles uh, available now with the cruise control, or then you can think from a, a more logical point of view on, on driver behavior. So, uh, we have these kind of small minibuses tested in several parts on, on, on the world now, and they operate according to this kind of rail-safe logic, meaning it's a switch. If there's something in the way, they stop. If there are kids playing football in front of, of this one, it will stand there until the kids move away. Uh, so this is uh, following a predefined trajectory, and it's, it stops uh, if anything is in the way. Uh, the next one we could call cautious driving logic, which is if we put the uh, developer of the vehicle uh, as responsible for the actions, then what would you do? You would program it very safe in order to ensure that it cannot cause any accident, meaning that you will have large gaps, you will have uh, quite... Uh, uh, safe behavior or cautious behavior in, in general. Uh, you would uh, require quite large gaps. So this is probably what you can expect the first kind of generation of vehicles uh, to be. Uh, then you can think about this kind of, of trying to look at uh, the manual drivers, the drivers today or the experienced driver, how do they behave uh, and try to think about, okay, let's, let's uh, think that an experienced drivers actually drive quite well, and then if we could uh, improve the capabilities in terms of sensors, uh, blind spots, and, and so on, and, and then we could have a shorter reaction time, and, and so on. Then we can think about this kind of machine learning approach, where we have this kind of perfect uh, sensors and perfect anticipation of the future. So, how might this affect uh, traffic? So, rail safe and cautious, they will focus on safety first, so they will be safer, but probably also then uh, increase uh, uh, congestion or at least decrease capacity because larger gaps and so on. But since they are safer, they probably cause less incidents and accidents, which is a large part of the total delay in a year in, in a metropolitan area. So, maybe there's a gain there at least. The all-knowing vehicles, uh, they have large potentials. There's what you see that they can actually uh, have a large good impact on, on the traffic, but it might be in Utopia. Will these vehicles anywhere be sold? Uh, and uh, they will probably then uh, require connectivity and cooperation. And the normal vehicles, they we don't really know what, what to expect there, but the quicker reactions, but maybe less good anticipation. Is it possible to learn the vehicle to anticipate what other uh, road users will do? And, and so, uh, but we cannot just think of those separately. So we need to think about what happens when they coexist. And uh, one possibility to deal with these uncertainties on, on the mix here 
is to think about uh, uh, trying to discretize this development of, of the automated vehicles. So in the project we're uh, running together with the several European partners, we have discretized this into three classes, kind of first, second, and third generation of, of automated vehicles, where you expect the first automated vehicles to be able to operate on motorways or arterials with barriers to oncoming traffic and um, pedestrians. So probably quite cautious, and then we'll get more and more advanced driving logics uh, the longer the time goes. And it's uh, reasonable to assume that there is some kind of correlation between this penetration rate of the uh, automated vehicles and the advanced versions of the different driving logics. So for the kind of introductory phase for low penetration rates, we'll have this kind of more uh, simple or first generations of automated vehicles, and then we'll go further. Uh, how should we then estimate this impact. Uh, what we do and work on now is to use something called traffic simulation, uh, which is a, a tool where you describe the behavior of individual vehicles, uh, and then this is put into a, a computer model, and by describing the behavior of each individual vehicle, then you can describe the traffic stream. I will uh, give you some conclusions where we are today. Uh, and probably not answer the question if it will decrease congestion, because that will still be the question mark. But uh, automated vehicles have the potential. It's easy to see that if you have 100% automated vehicles of this kind of all knowing, then you can have large benefits. But it's uh, quite uh, dependent on this long transition period where we'll have this mix of vehicles. And also, depending, of course, what the regulation says, maybe there will come regulation saying that some types of vehicles are not allowed or some types of uh, vehicles are, are allowed. So uh, we will maybe have some decrease of uh, congestion. It might be decreased during transition period, depending on how these vehicles will actually behave and, and what uh, deployment will have. And uh, we need then to consider these uncertainties. That's uh, for sure an important part. And we are currently then uh, running traffic simulation experiments, uh, both in, in national and international projects. And there are lots of other research around the world doing this as well. And to end with, I think this picture describes uh, the problem to some extent. We don't really know where the future will go. Uh, it will take us somewhere with automated vehicles, but how it will look until and if we're ever reaching 100% of this full automated vehicles that can take us everywhere.